think we can get started. Um, so we had our first uh, homework. It's passed with some hiccups. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the first homework and challenges you were facing as soon as we grade them and see everything that uh, has happened uh, in the process. Uh, but I want to um, let you know that the second homework is uh, released and is due in about 10-ish days. And uh, there is one thing that I didn't mention in the last lecture that's going to be important for the for your homework. So uh, I wanted to bring it up. Um, in, in homework, you're basically going to play around a little bit with SGD optimization, and then you're going to implement that uh, deep averaging network where you average embeddings of all the token embeddings in the input, and then uh, have a two, I think two layer neural network you train it and evaluate it on the same sentiment classification task. Uh, I originally had the same accuracy levels, but I increased them in the homework by 2%, so slightly lower than what we can achieve, such that if you have those slight, you know, half a point variations that you don't run into so many problems, like in the first um, assignment. So the accuracy is slightly lower uh, than what is uh, definitely achievable uh, for with this neural network. Um, so let me let me mention that one part that that was not mentioned in the in the um, lecture last time, and that's padding. Um, we said that we are not going to give one example at a time to our neural network. Instead, we are going to give a batch of examples. For example, eight uh, example if if our batch size is eight. So um, here where I had f of x, our representation of a single example being n-dimensional vector. Now we are going to have batch size times n matrix instead in our input. Okay, so we'll have, let's say we'll have um, example one. Oh, no. Okay. Ah, let me just try to see whether my pencil is dead. Let, give me just a second. Hopefully this will work out. All right, it's going to need to charge a little bit. So um, instead, I will try to write this on this board. If I have markers for that, hopefully I do. Okay, um, I'll try to write such that you can see them. Okay, so let's say we have a first example, X1 being um, path place. And then the second example, X2 is um, we are Keeping. These two sequences have different length. Here we have length of two and here we have length of three. So what we wanted to produce with batching is put this one. Um, well, that's the only marker I have. So try to try to listen. I, I'm sorry, there isn't uh, anything I can do at this point. So first sentence is cat place. Second sentence is we are eating. The point is that this one is of length of two and this one is of the length three, but we are trying to put them in the same matrix of the size, batch size times number of features. Um, and with the averaging, that's not really an issue because we are just going to average these embeddings. But your implementation can be a little bit more efficient if you add a special token thread over here. And this one now becomes uh, of the length three. You are, you are going to put as many pads as there is the max sequence length here. And this, if the pad here, if you assign it zero vector, then when you average your embeddings, it doesn't do anything, right? Because it's a zero vector. So 
adding pad here and having all of your sequences being of the same size and pad corresponding to a zero embedding enables you to work with matrices quickly instead of uh, you know, for each one of these, averaging them and then producing a tensor uh, or a matrix in this case, where you uh, put the, the resulting average vector in each one of these rows in the input. So it's just a way to be more efficient uh, with your computation. And as you see with the first assignment, we want you to produce code that is uh, not just hacky and takes forever to produce something, but it's also reasonably fast. So uh, in the homework, there will be mention of this word pad. So when you see that, this is what we are referring to. Pad, add these pad tokens to the maximum sequence length such that immediately you can start working with the, uh, uh, with the uh, matrices because each one of these is going to then be uh, turned into an index in its vocabulary. And then uh, you just look up the corresponding embedding in your huge embedding matrix and do whatever comes next, averaging, and and then uh, all of these uh, next operations. Okay, is there any question about padding? Okay, so today, after the lecture or tomorrow, anytime before we meet next, read for this new assignment. And then when we meet on Wednesday, we are, I'm gonna ask you again, are there any questions? They will. They might be content related. You might not figure uh, everything that's said in the assignment how it connects to the lecture. We can use the lecture time to go over those, you know, uh, clarifications. So please read it on time because you might have questions. I hope by going through the first assignment, if you struggle with it, you realize that um, debugging machine learning models is not like debugging any other algorithm. There are so many things that could be going wrong. And there isn't like this universal suggestion that someone might give you. There is randomness involved, which makes everything uh, extra annoying. So there are many things that might be going wrong. Again, start working early on this um, assignment. Any questions? Let me see, does this work? Wonderful, it does. Okay, give me a second to have my iPad thingy again. All right, it's there. Okay, uh, hopefully I didn't miss any of his hands. Uh, so let's then continue. Um, we have kind of finished our story about the uh, elements of a simple NLP system. Uh, we wanted to build a classifier. We have realized, okay, we need to find a way to represent our input sequence, our input text. We talked about tokenization and uh, embeddings and how to average embeddings. And then we put this into some algorithm whose uh, parameters we need to learn from the data. We talked the last about neural networks. And now you kind of know how to build one NLP system. You have your data, you have your representation, your algorithm that you're learning. And finally you have evaluation like precision, uh, accuracy, recall, uh, F1 score that you have evaluated in the first assignment. So that's a that's a full picture there. However, what we have covered is not exactly the top, you know, the cutting edge kinds of the models that we are using uh, today. Uh, we have heard about large language models, but what we have seen so far are not large language models. Um, I will go over some of the kind of annoying things that we didn't cover with the approaches we have so far. Reminder, remi I wanna remind you that we talked about word senses. And we said that a single word like Bayesian can have different meanings. It can refer to like a sink. It can refer to uh, a geographical uh, you know, term, a specific kind of a land and so on. Um, and when we are thinking about our word embeddings, uh, we, didn't really differentiate between these different senses of the same uh, word. So here I have the three occurrences of word basin, all with different meanings. The Amazon basin is the home to the largest rainforest on earth. She filled the basin with water to wash the dishes. The neurosurgeon examined the cranial basin for signs of trauma. All of these 
occurrences of word basin refer to some something else, right? They have different meanings. However, when we use our word to whack or glove embeddings, they are static, meaning regardless of the context in which these words appear, they will always have exactly the same representation. We are always looking up from the same matrix and picking the same embedding. We do not capture in any way that this word basing has different meanings. And this is, uh, this is a limitation, right? Um, we do not capture the right aspect of meaning when we use this static embedding. So our next goal will be to assign different so-called contextualized representations to each one of these words based on their surrounding context. So in the next uh, weeks, we'll see that uh, the representation for the word basin will not be the same in the first, second, and third sentence. Rather, the vector we get is going to be changed upon uh, the, the seeing the other words in this sentence. So that's going to be our next goal, to have these better contextualized representations. We have also seen that we are dealing with neural networks with a non-convex optimization, and that the initialization of our parameters matters. Remember, we would ideally have a nice convex function over here, which is like just a nice valley where stochastic gradient descent is going down, down, down with an appropriate step size and eventually comes to the bottom where our minimum is. But we don't deal with that perfect machine learning world. We deal with these kinds of situations where we have uh, these uh, local minima, these local values where if you have started here with your stochastic gradient descent, you are going to end up here. But that's your, not your global minima. Your global minima is over here. Or maybe you have a situation like here where your function plateaus and your stochastic gradient descent won't move anymore, right? So you are stuck again in this uh, local uh, minima instead of somewhere over there where our global minima is. So where we start matters a lot with neural networks. And what has been uh, revolutionized this NLP and now broader AI field is finding this starting point where instead of starting anywhere randomly like you will do in your homework, we are going to start in a very particular point that has been found by pre-training our neural network on some task that we are gonna to learn today for a long time, for months these days. For six months, we are doing this pre-training stage and then we find these weights of neural networks that then we can use uh, and for our end task. So over here, see where we were learning our weights, instead of random numbers over here, we will have some specially found numbers which will already put us in the right place in our very complex uh, loss, uh, loss space. And then uh, another issue that we didn't talk about, but you might have, when I said to you, okay, let's just average the embeddings of each individual token that appears in the input, you might have been slightly disappointed that that's, that's it, right? Because we didn't in any way say to our model, this is the first, second, or third word. We just average them. So the word order disappeared, right? If we had um, um, negation, for example, and negation comes before word good, so not good, now you forgot by averaging that not has been before this word and that it signals the negative sentiment. Here it can signal whatever. Um, so the, the loss of these positions is, is actually gonna, although sometimes things work with just averaging, as we we're gonna see in your homework that you can achieve decent accuracy, it's not gonna work for every single task and having the positional information about which in which place the word appeared is going to be important. And also related to this idea of contextualization, we will want to know this pairwise feature importances between the tokens in the input, like which words are important uh, together. And there is this concept of long range dependencies in language where your subject and let's say verb uh, might be far away from each other, which is a common thing that happens in German language, where the word comes at the very end of the sentence where its subject may had appeared at the very beginning. 
So these long range dependencies can be modeled and that's what we are gonna build up to when we uh, learn about the transformer architecture, which is the uh, core architecture that we use to this date for any kind of uh, neural approach in not only NLP, but also in vision in other areas. Okay, so what this is basically the timeline, what, what has happened in NLP field since 2017 that then kind of spilled over to other areas of machine learning. So now the other areas like computer vision and NLP are using the same neural architecture, the same way of training, everything is becoming similar and similar to each other. So although we are talking about this in the context of the NLP course, because this the core, course name is uh, NLP, this is goes beyond just uh, NLP. And everything that is happened in this period is what we are gonna talk about until our spring break. So this is the exactly the topic that are uh, for us, on our agenda next. So let's go over this timeline a little bit. I have said that uh, instead of having this neural network of the kind I have shown you last week, we are going to have a more specialized neural network called transformer. And its key component is gonna be that it's able to model this pairwise token importances, no matter how far they are among each other. And also it will model the positional uh, uh, position positional information about tokens in the input. So if the word had appeared first, that's gonna be um, embedded in this architecture. Transformer was produced in 2017. And then in 2018, what has happened is that idea that I described where instead of starting from the randomly initialized weights, you start in this very special place where that you have found by this procedure called pre-training, Pre-training is just training before you actually train your model for the task you care about. And through this pre-training, uh, this idea of this contextual representation also came about. Uh, that is not only from pre-training, but also from the transformer, which has this uh, capacity to model these pairwise feature importances. And this is where models such as BERT and GPT-4 had emerged, if you have heard about them. No worries if not, these are just very, um, very popular and very well-known uh, models in this space. In 2019, we had another uh, model that's uh, commonly used, T5, but nothing like technically, nothing major has happened in 2019. However, in 2022, that's where GPT-3 has been released and this idea of prompting models has also um, it's not like the first time this has been proposed, but it is the time that it has been popularized and where these models could actually work somewhat if we give them um, just one or two examples and ask them to do the task. Again, in 2021, I think this, this whole community has looked into GPT-3 more closely. And uh, then in 2022, we had more, uh, you know, bigger advances by fine-tuning models to follow instructions to have this idea of prompting being, um, you know, working much better. So models that have been produced in this year work way better than GPT-3 uh, is working. And this is also where uh, generative AI has, um, the term itself had emerged. Today, we are going to learn about generative models and um, generative AI is just this idea of, you know, approaching everything as text generation. And given that we have trained models to follow instructions, this actually works now. Um, whereas before it didn't work well. So, you know, although the concept of behind generative AI has been known for a very, very long time, it is the first time where that idea could be scaled and actually implemented for many things. And then in the in the last year, learning from human feedback using reinforcement learning has also been scaled, popularized, and that's where ChatGPT had emerged that we don't know of uh, today. So as I said, uh, until the uh, you know our spring break, we are going to focus on uh, learning all of these concepts and learning what large language models are. Uh, this week specifically, we are going to focus on two old or classical NLP tasks called language modeling and machine translation. 
uh, that had influenced this 2017 to 2018 stage and these ideas about what the generative AI is. So first we are gonna learn about those tasks and then see how through history they had influenced where this field is going, how they brought us to this transformer architecture uh, and the idea of pre-training by doing language modeling, uh, basically. Are there any questions about this uh, timeline? Yeah. From your perspective, does it does it feel like things are moving faster now than they were five years ago? Or is that just like public perception now that they do? Yeah, it's definitely moving faster uh, than before. Um, I would say I, I entered this field in uh, late 2015. Uh, so that's when, you know, neural networks had already like becoming a thing that we are using um, if you're on a cutting edge side of the things. So I wouldn't say that I ever was a part of this field when things were like mega relaxed, you know, you can do your research and you should not worry whether, you know, uh, you're going to publish it in a year or two years because it doesn't matter. Uh, but um, recently things are just moving uh, crazy fast. Um, if you go to archive and they have statistics about how many papers are published in each category uh, every year, I think when I entered the field, it was something like 600 and now it's over, you know, uh, it's thousands and thousands. It's really, really wild. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have uh, any... What do you think the future technology in this area would be like? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. Um, there is a lot of technical challenges still uh, that are not addressed. So, for example, planning uh, your your language models. They, uh, as we'll learn, and maybe that's now hard to grasp because we still haven't covered what language models are. But they have this um, ability to kind of be very good at the you know, single turn interactions. You say something now and we have a short conversations. But if you want to do like planning for on a larger scale that involves uh, multiple people and where you need to consider, um, you know, um, more bigger goals like a societal goals, that's where these things do not have, you know, they, they don't have the power to to do any of that. So there are still like lots of technical uh, technical challenges uh, to be done, you know, to be able to have these models um, do all sorts of the things we know. So one of the uh, prominent researchers in the field in terms of this planning has said, you have like two types of students, students who put a lot of, lot of work and then maybe they will figure out how ideas you have shown them translate into, you know, new, new examples and then you have uh, students who can just quickly grasp things and LLMs are like this first kind of a student where if you give a lot of material they might retrieve them and be able to put together pieces to find a solution but it's kind of like really having amazing abstraction and being able to generalize quickly from it that's that's what's missing. So there is that, but there is like a zillion other things. And uh, I have left some of the lectures at the end of the course to for more like these kinds of discussions. So we, we can definitely have a more lengthier future oriented discussion then. Yeah, not only, I, I don't know like, they don't know how to correct themselves. Yeah, so um, yeah, there is, I mean, I don't know what exactly are you referring to, but there is this idea of editing language models where you can localize the information, uh, like certain facts such as current president of the United States is Joe Biden. You can find the weights in your neural network uh, that encode that information. That's called localization. And there is a whole line of open line of work that we don't know how to do this yet, but if you now, there is a new president next year and we want to override those weights uh, with this new information without retraining the whole network, how to do that properly, that's not something that we know how to do yet. There is that, but then there is also um, this whole idea of whether there is a paper called Large Language Models Know What They Do Not Know. Um, so the idea of, you know, of whether we can retrieve the information from the model itself that the model is not capturing well, 
there is some sense that that might be possible, but all of this is very, you know, open and there aren't, you know, clear, reliable techniques. So let's, let's to do it. Yeah. Can you compare the current state of LLM with any of the living beings, the way they learn or the way they acquire knowledge? Okay, so the question is about how are they doing things they are doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there is the a field of interpretability. Recently, people also use the term mechanistic interpretability to specify it's about understanding the internal mechanisms rather than people interacting and you know the helping people to understand how these things work. And uh, it's still very much open and it's extremely hard um, to specify why exactly these things are doing what they are doing, but there is a lot of research on, okay, these, uh, if I do this kind of intervention, this might happen and I can explain you why, or this is what this layer is doing. But again, it's still, these techniques are not perfect. As I mentioned with the, for example, localization and editing, you still have uh, lots, lots, you know, lots of mistakes that these techniques are doing. So your interpretability technique itself is not perfect and therefore your conclusions might not be exactly what you think they are. So again, another very active area of, of research. Um, community, mechanistic and interpretability community has um, a habit of producing really good blog posts and tutorials. So if you search a little bit about this term, you will quickly find a lot of, you know, um, getting started in this space, which might be interesting. Like, can you say these are like this black box? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, we... One, I mean, that's the case with any kind of neural approach, um, especially ones that are deeper. Um, unlike with the traditional programming where you write the code and you have your implementation. So if someone tells you, hey, I notice you, your code is making a mistake here. Can you correct it? You go back to your code, you debug it. You find, I don't know, if condition that doesn't make sense, you correct it and say to back to a person, hey, that was the mistake and now it's uh, corrected. That's not something we can do with uh, the no large language models or large neural networks. You don't have the ability to, you can observe the mistake, but your ability to do, then do intervene on this mistake is, is very limited. Like you can't pinpoint where exactly and why the model is making this mistake because it's find the solution on its own from the data. Okay, so let's, take a few steps back. I know this is an exciting topic. I'm happy to hear there is a sense of excitement. Uh, we'll come to all of these things as we go. And as I said, like later on in the course, we can have a very, you know, more discussion uh, oriented um, questions about, you know, uh, societal technical questions relating to uh, LLMs. But uh, let's, let's go a few years back and uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, engram language models. So first of all, uh, generating models uh, are this other class of models. Um, remember I mentioned discriminating models that are modeling uh, the conditional probability of your label uh, rather than a joint probability. And generating models describe uh, probabilist probability distribution over uh, some structure in NLP. We uh, care about sequences of tokens, right? So generating models in NLP are going to give us probability of sequences of tokens. And models that assign probabilities uh, to sequences of words are called language models, or we should use the abbreviation LMs. And then when we add large, we have LLMs. But for now, we just have L LMs. We don't have LLMs. And the language modeling task itself is the task of predicting the next word in a sequence, given the sequence of preceding words. So very simple idea, right? There, it's so it's very, very basic. We can describe it uh, in a very plain English. Um, a reasonable question you might ask, well, why would we ever wanna assign probabilities uh, to sequences of words, right? Like who cares about that? Um, and, you know, traditionally before we knew that this is going to be a powerful technique to pre-train models and have this, you know, large language modeling revolution, they still had a utility. It was for, for example, if you had noisy inputs, such as in 
speech recognition. If, uh, for example, I have an accent, so if uh, if uh, you are listening to me, you might, you know, be confused with a certain phrase I said, and a model might be confused as well, and model might be uh, then in the background computing the probability of the possible phrases that I have said and uh, determine the most probable one as the one to show in the transcription, let's say. Uh, similarly, for spelling correction, if there is, a, uh, you know, a mistake, the model might uh, notice that mistake by finding that the probability of that phrase where that mistake occurs is uh, is very low. So that's suspicious, and therefore we can highlight to maybe to correct that uh, phrase. Uh, but also this idea of predicting the next word is uh, relevant in, uh, you know, machine translation, where given some text in one language, you want to translate it automatically to uh, to text in another language. And here again, because when you're translating, you are have, you are generating these phrases, but then you need to, in the process, the model also need to understand how these uh, bits and pieces it's translating fit together, because not every language has the exact same syntax. So if you're going left to right and translating, maybe in the end what you're producing is not necessarily completely, uh, you know, incoherent, but it might be grammatically very weird. And if you have this notion of probability, then you would get, well, your translation has a low probability uh, in, the, in that uh, language. And that's a useful information. And as I said, now that was like a historical motivation for this task uh, of predicting the next word and uh, for measuring, for computing the Probabilities, probabilities of sequences, but then this idea had been scaled up to do this pre-training where we take a very large corpus and we predict the next word at a time and change the parameters of our network to be able to do that. And then we take whatever weights we have acquired through that process and later on we can use it for many tasks. And uh, I, I don't wanna go over that, but I re recommend if you're interested, to read this, um, it's not. It's like a blog post or very informal writing by Joab Goldberg, who is a prominent NLP researcher, where he reflected on some talks that he has given before this pre-training era, where he would he was saying things like, "Yeah, um, uh, if I have a lots of money, I would train uh, a very large uh, language model to show it doesn't work, that it can't solve all the things we want," which then he's reflecting how that wasn't really, really true what he was saying, because now we have seen how far that approach had uh, brought us, but also it didn't get us to the like human level intelligence either. So he wasn't entirely wrong, but it, he wasn't entirely correct either. And I think seeing these thoughts from someone who has been in the field for a long time and then how they reflect about this idea of what kind of correlations just the task of language modeling can give us is, is really uh, interesting. And it's really short and really informally written. So you can definitely read it in a short time. Okay, so hopefully you are convinced that yes, this task always had made sense. Um, so how we can go about this? First, first of all, I wanna remind you what an engram is. We have talked about this, but just again, n-gram is a sequence of n tokens, and we'll call one gram unigram, two gram bigram, and three uh, gram trigram. So just know that it's very unconventional to write these one, two, three grams. You'd rather use these uh, these phrases. And um, Google has this very cute uh, n-gram viewer, so you can write here whatever n-gram, which here is a sequence of n words and see how the trend of those engrams had changed uh, during the past. So, uh, and then people also use this um, Google engram to do some kind of uh, research on, on engrams. Okay, so um, just a reminder that we were talking about the well, computing the probability of a given, of a word given the history, the, the sequence of tokens that had appeared before it. And we are also interested in what's the probability of the entire sequence. These two questions, as we are gonna soon see, are very related to each other. And one idea you might have, well, uh, let's take a huge corpus and let's uh, count how many times we can see uh, this whole sequence. It's water is so transparent that the, so the, the, the engram where the appears at the end, 
divided by the count of uh, of uh, the history. It's what is so transparent that. So basically how many times uh, this sequence is gonna be followed by the word the. And that's totally reasonable thing to do. Uh, however, the issue is that language there are so many ways we can express uh, ourselves with a finite uh, vocabulary, right? We have said there are infinite ways to express ourselves with just a finite vocabulary. So even, even if we had scraped the entirety of the web, uh, we would still not get great estimates for all the probabilities of all the sequences. Um, simple extensions of this example might have zero probability just because we didn't see it with the, you know, maybe here, instead of it's water, we have specified something that it might be uh, entity, someone's name that's not frequently uh, seen uh, in the corpora. So all the reasonable, this won't work. Okay, so let's see what will work. Um, first, we should recognize that the joint probability of a sequence of N words uh, can be by chain rule decomposed in the product of conditional probabilities. This is just probability one-on-one. -on -one. We just use the chain rule. And then if you wrote, write it in a more compact way, you will get, uh, get uh, this formula. Um, so the idea we are gonna deploy is to approximate the history uh, instead of computing the probability of a word given its entire history. So it's here, instead of having the conditional probability of the nth word given all of the n minus one words that preceded it, we are going to approximate this history. So for example, with the bigram model, we might care just about the word that has preceded uh, the current word. So instead of this entire history of n minus one words, we just take the uh, second to uh, the, the last word we have generated or the, excuse me, not generate, the last word we have seen. So n minus one word is the uh, last word we have seen so far. So we are uh, approximating these conditional probabilities and because we have uh, only cared about a word and the word that has preceded it, we talk about the bigram model. And here, this might be kind of familiar to you if you have heard about Markov assumptions you might recognize that this is the first order Markov assumption. If we think about um, each one of these words uh, being uh, seen on this particular place in the text, you can think about this as random variables. And this can be more precisely rewritten as a random variable at the end position, taking the value of W n. Uh, and then uh, you having that probabilistic notion and using Markov assumption, Markov assumption says that then you can take uh, the probability of this uh, random variable, which is for us a word, depending only on the value of the previous uh, random variable. And of course, this can be generalized. We Here we have bigram. Uh, I cared only about the preceding word, but you can uh, care about capital N preceding words. Uh, still, you don't take the entire history, but take a little bit longer history than just the preceding word, and then you would deploy uh, n minus one uh, order mark of assumption. And now that you have approximated these uh, probabilities, uh, you can rewrite this equation over here, where instead of having this entire history, you just care about the preceding word, and similarly for the general equation. Yes. When you come to um, Ungrant's model, that means bigrant, three grants, they have different probability distributions. How do you organize them in a model? Um, not, not really. So Ungrant model is exactly what's uh, written over here. It is the model that gives us the probability of a sequence of um, lowercase n uh, words. And this probability is now under the Ingram model, uh, approximated as the product of conditional probabilities, 
where we assume, make a certain assumption. If we make assumption that only preceding work is what we care in our history, we have a bigram model. If we cared about two preceding words, we would have trigram model. It depends on what goals we want to give our own model or what it does. Yeah, it basically cares about how we approximate the history. Instead of taking the entire preceding uh, sequence, we take um, a shorter version of it, you know, and it depends how many words we are going to take. Uh, you can have capital N. You might want to have all except the first, uh, which would be um, probably not significant change to, to this uh, full equation. So typically you will see trigram models. Um, but I will talk in a second about how assuming short history might be a problem. So just to be uh, sure we understand the terms here, engram model refers to a model that gives the probability to this sequence of n tokens. And uh, we make an, uh, Markov's assumptions to make bigram models, for example, because we approximate history with just the preceding token. Yeah. Uh, not to confuse engram models with engrams themselves. Engram is just a sequence of n tokens. Okay. All right. Any questions about anything on this slide? Yeah. Yeah. W one is the sequence. W one uh, is the first uh, word in the in this sequence, and then you have n n words in your sequence. I mean, in the in the bigram model, the value is the second. This one, or this one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is the uh, okay. You are asking about this subscript over here. Is that something that's new? Yeah. Okay. So this is just a, a shorter way to uh, to write uh, uh, w one to w n minus one. So here you see over here, this is the same as this thing over here. It's just a short way of writing a sequence of uh, that goes from one to n minus one. Yeah. So if I had here one two three, that would mean a sequence w one w two w three. Yeah. Just a shorter notation. Yes. N minus one. Yeah, of course. So here, uh, with the bigram model, we are assuming that uh, we can approximate these uh, conditional probabilities by only looking at the uh, our condition is only the previous uh, word. With the and uh, here, n equals two when we have the bigram model, capital N equals two. Uh, a general equation for any capital N would uh, say uh, then you take the capital N preceding words. So if we had capital N being three, we would care about the uh, conditional probability of seeing the current word given two preceding words. So it's always one minus because you have, um, you also care about the current word you're looking at. So if we cared about four grams, then we will care about uh, the conditional probability of a current word given three preceding words to it. Uh, so that's all there is to this. And it's just a way to write previous capital N minus one words. It's a little bit like cumbersome, but that's what this uh, subscript is saying over here. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Again, uh, now we have our model. Again, you remember every time I tell you now we have a model, that means just we wrote the way to uh, formula to get what we want. Previously, that would be like a binary prediction, but here is the probability of the entire uh, sequence. Still, uh, we don't have, I didn't show you these exact probabilities, right? And uh, with the, um, you know, just the standard engram language models, uh, you can estimate these Engram probabilities, again, going back to your counts, but now your counts are simpler. They are not those counts of those super long strings. So to approximate the probability of uh, end word given its preceding uh, word W n minus uh, one in a bigram model, because we made that assumption that we care just about the previous token, uh, then we are gonna measure the relative frequency of seeing this bigram 
uh, the preceding word and the current word, divided by the sum of counts of the preceding words with any other word. So this is just a way to normalize again, to get that sense of zero to one uh, from all the other, like in, we take all the bigrams where the uh, W n minus one occurs and uh, we measure all of those counts and we, uh, here that's going to be our uh, normalizer. Um, it turns out that the sum of counts of all bigrams where WN minus one is the first word in this bigram equals to the count of the unigram WN minus one. Uh, it takes just a little bit of mental gymnastics to, to, see, uh, to see that. So we will see commonly this equation, not this one, but uh, this one over here, that the probability of the current nth word uh, given the preceding word WN minus one equals to the, can be approximated with the count of the bigram WN minus one WN over the, uh, how many times the word WN minus one occurs in your corpus. And that's how you estimate that probability. Uh, for a moment, you might feel tricked. Like I have shown you counts before and I have said that that's not gonna work out. And now we are seeing counts again. So what has changed? It's important to see that now we are counting just bigrams, not all of the, uh, you know, all of those long, long, uh, possibly long sequences uh, as, as the one I have shown you over here. So here we had to measure the count. It's water is so transparent that the, uh, and that's way longer than just a bigram. And as, as the longer and longer and longer the text gets, uh, these counts will certainly become less and less likely to show up in our corpus. So we've broken down with the chain rule these uh, probabilities into something smaller and, and also by using the uh, approximation, uh, Marco assumption approximation, and then we got something which is actually more reasonable to be found in the corpora. And again, the general case with any capital N is written over there. Okay, any questions about these relative frequencies, estimating probabilities with the relative frequencies? Uh, sorry, say again? Uh -huh. Yeah, so this one here, the way to read it is the count of seeing a bigram WN minus one WN. So if our, uh, let's imagine for a mobile WN is uh, A and WN minus one is a cat, then this this says to measure, to count how many times a bi bi bigram A cat occurs in our corpora. Yeah, I don't know this one? Uh, no. This one. <laughs> Um, uh, the first equation in which the denominator. This one. Yeah. Okay. So here, um, the difference is that we have any any W here. So, yeah, exactly. So you you go over your vocabulary and then you uh you count how many times that word W occurs after the word W and minus one. So let's say our vocabulary consists only of another word, dog you would measure how many times um, we see a dog in the in the uh, corpus. Yeah. And it serves just as a normalizer, yeah. Thanks, yeah, this is good. Uh, please keep asking me about the notation because, you know, for me, it's easy to forget that some of these things not, might not be as common as I, as I think, yeah. So for the second part of the diagram equation, the later study and minus one, does that also include parts where that word would be on the second part of the diagram? Uh, yeah, so here, uh, here it must be the first word of the diagram. But if you, um, if you are, like here, we don't care about diagrams anymore. Here we have a unigram. Here we just measure, count how many times that unigram one word WN minus one occurred in the in the um, corpus. Um, I mean, 
idea being well uh uh if this this count always follows by some next word right so it's the same thing basically yeah but the order here matters so we can't switch these things up yeah it matters okay so um we have we had the model like we we are measuring pro joint probability of entire input sequence with the composite in by using chain rules into product of conditional probabilities we use markov assumption to simplify those conditional probabilities that we can now estimate by uh by counting to some extent because this again won't be you know flawless so here is an example. Gorillas always like to groom their friends. Here, the likelihood of the word there depends on knowing that gorillas is plural. If there was one gorilla, we the likelihood of there would be way, way smaller. So we know, kind of need to know that gorillas had appeared here to have a high probability of there, but gorilla is um, a few, few steps removed from the word there. Right, so a bigram model won't be really good here. Similarly here, the computer that's on the third floor of our office building crashed. The likelihood of generating, of seeing, observing the word crash depends on knowing that the subject of this sentence is a computer, right? If there is uh, another word, something that can't really crash, we wouldn't really use that uh, word. And its probability of the crash would be uh, way smaller uh, than. So the issue is uh, that with the low capital N, which is the size of our n-grams, the resulting language model would offer probabilities that are too low for these sentences and too high for sentences that fail basic linguistic tests like number agreement, which is uh, this property over here that gorillas and there are in the, uh, the right uh, agreement number, meaning that we are talking about plural noun. So that's an issue. Then again, uh, if we really want to model this well, we would need a six gram, but uh, to, to estimate the probabilities of six grams, this six gram, the sequence of six words, need to occur sufficiently frequently in our corpus. Otherwise, their probabilities over here are going to be zero. Every time you see, uh, you do not observe a given capital N gram in your corpus, this probability is zero. And the longer your capital N grams are, less likely they are gonna occur in the corpus. We can imagine that, right? Like we can see that unigrams will appear way more than uh, six grams. So this problem where we are not seeing where we have many of these zeros. Many of these probabilities are zeros just because we done, did not observe the corresponding engrams in our corpus is called sparsity. So having many of these uh, zero probability cases where they should have actually some non-zero probability because they're not impossible in the language, it's just that we haven't observed them in a given corpus. So too low is not great. Very high uh, capital N is also not great. Uh, typically in practice, you will see trigrams, um, but then we'll see when we start to talk about neural approaches to this, that uh, this all could be improved uh, if we move from these, um, these kinds of estimates. So instead of counting, we are gonna work toward a neural network that's gonna predict these probabilities for us. Okay, questions about sparsity. Is that intuition clear? How we are gonna get these zero probabilities? Okay, I see some nods. Um, before we move into something you know extra like a neural network, uh, there are tricks that people had deployed before neural things were things. Um, so here I am just um, showing you again how these zero probabilities might occur. You might have a known word WN, but it occurs in a bigram you have never seen. And now the conditional probability of this, uh, this conditional probability is going to be zero. And therefore the probability of your entire sequence, because we remember we are 
making a product of these conditional probabilities. So just because you didn't see one bigram, now whole thing is rubbish, uh, which is not great. And this is why uh, these uh, simple tricks have been uh, introduced. One is called smoothing. Smoothing is a very simple idea where you add a little bit of count to every single word you have seen uh, in the, um, to, uh, to every single one of these um, counts. Uh, so for example, if uh, this is the general equation for smoothing of the type lit stone, in a lit stone framework of smoothing, you just have this kind of equation and then the different variants are just changing this uh, parameter alpha. So with the Laplace smoothing, which is the most standard smoothing you will ever hear about, you just add count to every single possible uh, bigram, uh, but you still need to uniformly distribute uh, this uh, mass that you now have given. So to every count, you are giving a little bit of little bit of probability mass, and you have um, this this thing in the uh, denominator just to have valid probabilities in the end. But the idea is just add some pseudo codes, just add every biogram, like one count. It appeared once in our uh, corpus, although it didn't really appear. So you won't have these um, zeros, you won't see them. They will just get very low probabilities. And then when you make a product of them, it's not going to throw off your entire uh, equation. So with the smoothing, you are giving, giving every biogram a little bit. Um, Every, every single one of them gets it. Uh, discounting, absolute discounting is slightly different. You're still giving these little counts, but instead of giving it uniformly to all bigrams, instead of you shave off a little bit of probability from those that had appeared frequently and give it to those that have not been observed in the data. So the only difference between smoothing and discounting is whether, how are you changing this probability mass uniformly, as in smoothing, or you are kind of taking from some that have too much and giving it away to some that have uh, none, as in discounting. Yeah. What does the V here mean? Uh, yeah, V is the vocabulary, and then the this is notation for the size of vocabulary. Number or vocabulary is our um, set of unigrams, right? Of all, of all of the words that are indexed in our corpus. And then the this notation, when we have these bars over a set for any set, not just vocabulary, for any set, that's the size. So this is basically notation for the number of tokens we have in the vocabulary. Yeah. And this is just because we are going to then distribute this uh, equally. You need to normalize this properly. Okay, so this is smoothing. It kind of takes care of those zeros for us a little bit. Uh, not still not you know perfect. Um, still we still will have some issues even with smoothing, uh, but it is better than assigning zero probabilities. And finally, uh, before we move into neural approaches to language modeling, uh, I want to mention how how our language models are evaluated in you know more scientific space. So here, accuracy doesn't really make sense. When you're predicting the next word, um, there isn't like a the word to predict, right? You could predict any word that makes grammatical and you know coherent sense in that language. So accuracy doesn't make sense because you don't have the exact word you wanna uh, predict. So when you are evaluating uh, language models, you will never see accuracy. Instead, you will have some held out test set, some test set, some corpus that you have not used to estimate those probabilities by counting. So it's held out. And you want to see the likelihood of your test set giving your model. And instead of reporting exactly the likelihood, in the literature, you will see the exponential of the average negative log likelihood, which is called perplexity. And perplexity is a measure of um, evaluating language models 
the lower the perplexity is, the better your uh, language model is. It kind of says that your held out test set, it's not surprising to your model, which we want because that's the text that actually exists. Um, you know, someone had produced it. It's not rubbish. It's, it's a coherent text in your language. This is perplexity is usually just reported in research papers, not elsewhere. There isn't a magical number. Um, you will see ranges from 10 to uh, 200. Um, and this may be, be useful only to know that if you are outside of this range, you might be a little bit suspicious. Uh, I think if you get lower than 10, okay, maybe you have data that's so close to the data you have seen. So maybe that won't be as suspicious, but if you have something that's way larger than 200, that would mean like something might funky might be going on because I'm getting this perplexity that's uh, way too high. Yeah, and just because you have low perplexity, it doesn't mean that later on we'll see that your language models will be great uh, for whatever application you have in mind. So people have shown that that perplexity of language models and accuracy on the downstream task when we fine tune these language models for the task doesn't necessarily correlate. Uh, but it does say that you have fitted your language model on the data well. And as long as you pick the right data, that might then lead to whatever you want to have in the future, which kind of has driven these large language model approaches. Okay, questions about perplexity? Yeah. Is it is it perspective to this like uh other measure of how good the model is? Well, that's very broad. Uh, I mean, it is a measure of one specific model, a language model, how good it is, measured by how um well it fits, um, how well uh, it approximates the likelihood of the given piece of text you have that you held out and you did not use it to produce those counts during the training. So you are not wrong, it's just that it's a little bit more specific than that. We are, this is a measure for evaluating language models. It's not gonna be a measure to evaluate sentiment classifier. Yeah. Just to make sure I have this right. Mm -hmm. To evaluate the perplexity, you take all the W1, WN uh, mm -hmm. instances from your held out data, mm -hmm. and you see how likely the model thinks those are. Yeah, you basically see whether their likelihood is high, which is a little bit confusing because we here we have negative log likelihood, negative likelihood in the uh, in the perplexity equation. Also, I didn't, I said here log likelihood, but in the equation, you don't see uh, actually logs, you see probabilities, but we have learned by now, I hope that these things are, are the same. So you can slap logarithm here and have the sum of log probabilities or just the product of probabilities. And I, I think this form is here maybe more common, but honestly, I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, and I think, um, so here, this is for a single sequence, and then you might have, you know, k documents of the length n, and then you report the average perplexity over these. Yeah. Okay, and commonly it's also abbreviated with PPL, so you might see see that um, it might, you know, try to try to remember it refers to perplexity. Okay, so now we're gonna move into neural approaches. Um, Quick reminder, we have seen this couple slides back, but this is uh, the way we are, uh, you know, estimating the probabilities is by measuring these counts. And um, as I said that, you know, um, we have seen issues such as sparsity and we have deployed things like smoothing. Uh, but the question we might, you know, someone had raised is, can we use more history by having a neural network predicting the next word and having a neural network that's able to look at more than just preceding a uh, word, it might have seen the longer history and not be affected by these um, issues that we have seen with the uh, standard language models. So just to kind of, uh, this is a very simple illustration, but with uh, neural language models, what is happening is you have 
you know, you start with some token, let's say beginning of sequence token, and then you predict what might be the next word. Then you have that word and you predict what's next word. You have that word and you predict what's next and, and so on. That's that's the general uh, idea. You are seeing these, um, you know, sequences and predicting what comes next. Going back to our feed forward neural networks, um, what, what must be changed to use it to predict the next word? So first of all, our vocabulary previously had, uh, let's say for binary classification, two classes. But now any of the words in our vocabulary could be um, a possible option. So our output space, our label space, is the same as our vocabulary because we are predicting the next word. So that's one thing. And remember, we have said that there is 30,000 of uh, tokens in the common vocabularies. So our matrix here becomes gigantic. Here, previously, we had with binary classification two times D matrix, but now we have this 30,000 times D matrix, enormous matrix. That's why Remember I told you, we don't want our vocabulary to be enormous and we actually don't have possibility to include every single possible word in English language because this matrix would be so enormous that we would not fit it on our hardware and we could hardly do anything with, uh, with it. So the size of the vocabulary matters once you start using neural approaches to language modeling. That's the first thing we need to change. And now remember here, we have taken the average embedding of uh, all embeddings in our input. But here we are not making the sequence level decision, right? We are not taking the entire input sequence and then making a prediction. Rather for uh, seeing like one word, we try to predict the next one. Then seeing two words, we try to predict the next one. And then seeing three words, we are trying to predict the next one. So we are kind of seeing partial inputs and from partial inputs, we are trying to um, predict the next word. So here, this should be a representation of the last token in the sequence we have processed so far, and then we try to predict the next one. So this is a slight difference, and I did not specify how we are going to do that uh, yet. Let me see whether I want to do this now or... Yeah, maybe let's try to try to see what this could be. We're not going to go into details because our goal is to build up to the transformer that's, and that's going to be the thing we are going to use in the future. Uh, but for now, maybe let's just brainstorm some uh, ideas. So what did I have here? We are eating. So here we are eating. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so previously we had a vector for each one of these, right? And we made an average vector and we got the vector and then we did matrix multiplication and so on. So that was previously. Uh, here, let's say we are trying to predict the word eating. So we have V, R. So some options we might deploy um, are we could still, you know, average just these two. Excuse me. We could take the average of just these two to get the vector and then again multiply it, do the other operations until we predict the word eating. But notice that when we, if we wanted to predict word R, then we had only word V. So here we would just take the vector of V, where here we took the average of V R. So kind of changes depending on, um, you know, as we as we move to the next word prediction, our our what we have is input representation also is a slightly different. Uh, you know, here instead of averaging, we might want to concatenate this, but then here the size of this um, matrix would be different, and so on. Um, here, I am not very specific about what exactly we are doing. That's not the point of me, of what I'm trying to describe here. But I want you to remember 
is when, when we are making the next word prediction, we are, what's the input to the neural network is the history so far. And the history so far changes as we are predicting more words. So this, the way we are designing our input has to be slightly different. And here, I don't want now to give you any concrete example of this because eventually we are going to use transformer and that's the thing that's going to define what our input is. But just remember that there is this slight, a slight, you know, difference. Okay, so imagine now for a moment, I have told you how exactly you are going to get the vector for your current token. So imagine we are at we are, the last word we have processed is R, and we are trying to predict the next word. And we have representation of R that considers also the word we. So that's our current representation. From that representation, uh, we uh, you know do the nonlinearity and blah 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 blah. The same thing we have done before, and now we get the you know final representation, final hidden representation of the sequence so far with the focus on the last process token. And then as before, as with binary classification, we are trying to do prediction. And here just the label space has changed. Instead of the two classes and instead of having two uh, columns of rows in the output matrix, we have the, uh, the number of tokens in the vocabulary uh, dimension in our output matrix. And when we do this multiplication, we are again going to end up with a logics vector. And that vector now is going to be of the size of number of words in the vocabulary instead of two as in uh, binary classification. But again, everything stays the same. We apply softmax, we get some notion of probability. I dimension here is the probability that the next token is the token in the vocabulary. And this whole, um, after we apply softbox, what we are getting is the distribution over our vocabulary. And if you really want to produce the word and spell it, you know, show it visibly like in chat GPT style, then we can take the token with the highest probability as the one we display, which is not, this is called greedy decoding and is not always the one we deploy. We will talk about other strategies of sampling from the distribution over the vocabulary. The point I wanna make here is that things kind of stay the same as with the previous, uh, you know, approach, like the binary classification neural uh, approach. Uh, as long as we have this representation of the current token, the one before the next token we are gonna predict, we have a larger output matrix, and that's about it, right? Everything did all the everything else stays stays the same. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so um Just to take a step back, uh, before with the non-neural approach, with just a statistical pro approach to language modeling, we were trying to measure the, we were trying to quantify the conditional probability of a token given its preceding tokens. And if I'm not clear, this is exactly what we are also getting here. Here, for each one of the possible tokens in the vocabulary, we are getting its some notion of probability given its history, given the pre previously processed uh, tokens in the, in the input. So you are getting the same thing, not the same thing, you're getting the same thing in a sense, you're also getting the conditional probabilities and this is a neural language model. Yeah. Is that green uh, like representation of the current token, does that include whatever history in there too? Ideally, yes. So ideally, uh, we would have this token. Uh, if we are, at, imagine again a sentence, we are. Uh, this would be a representation of R, hidden representation of R, where uh, also information about uh, previously seeing word we and the lexical meaning of the word we has been captured also in this representation. And that's what transformers will do for us. Uh, with averaging, uh, you are losing the positional information that we had appeared before R. Uh, 
Um, and yeah, I think that's about it with averaging. You're just losing what, what's being seen uh, before. The more history we have as well, you won't also capture that all of these words will be equally important or there won't be any sense of like these words are interacting with each other uh, in certain ways. So you are also not capturing that, something that transformers will capture. So yeah, don't focus too much on what exactly representation here is because eventually we are going to learn what that is. For now, um, it's important to know, okay, there is some representation of a current token I have process. I'm predicting the next word based on the representation of that token. And it's important to know that you're getting this probability distribution of, over vocabulary. Yeah. Um, with this, are our word embeddings still constant? Uh, so yeah, I mean, um, again, with when we move to transformers, there will not be these representations um, that we are going to get. We'll capture the information from the previous tokens in this uh, sentence, and therefore they will be contextualized. So this vector over here somehow will capture okay, there is a semantics of this current word like R, but then I have also seen the word we before, and this word has these kind of features. All of that will magically be captured in this one representation. So um, again, just be a little bit patient, but uh, when we move to contextual representations and pre-training, uh, then these will not be static. But if we are starting with static word embeddings and we are just averaging them, yes, then, um, you have used the same representation of this current token, but this representation, if we are averaging with the embedding of, let's say, word we, is going to be slightly different. So it's somewhat contextualized, but yeah, not sufficiently, I would say. And again, not, not worthy remembering of this like little illustration of averaging. I am showing, to, telling here because just this is just to be able to talk about these other computations I want to talk about, and we are going to learn about what this vector here is exactly in a, in a week's, week or so. Uh, that said, uh, because, because, you know, we're not going to go into recurrent neural networks uh, a lot, but I just want to mention it. Uh, eventually, we are going to, as I said, probably a gazillion times, talk about transformers, but this uh, fact that uh, these fit forward neural networks can handle variable length inputs, that each position in the feature vector has uh, fixed semantics, uh, has been um, addressed for a brief moment with these uh, recurrent neural networks, where here you have your standard neural fit forward neural networks, but um, you also include the hidden representation of the previous token. So see here in this equation, you have this extra term of what was the previous uh, hidden representation. And as you are moving in this sequence, you are kind of, um, you know, aggregating information about the sequence. So when you get to this point, let's say here, you had captured what is in the previous, uh, what has been the previous hidden representation, but the previous hidden representation itself has captured what has been previous hidden representation. And therefore recursively, you are capturing information about the entire sequence. The issue with the RRNs, in theory, they are absolutely capable of handling all of this. Like this recursion I mentioned, there should be no forgetting, no catastrophic forgetting where at the 10th token, you forgot what was the first one in theory. But in practice, this actually happens. Like the information, like the longer you go, you start forgetting what has been happening. And this is due to so-called vanishing gradients. And uh, because we have a 10 age here or other nonlinearity, um, they saturate, right? Like they, at extremes, they are, they have this plateau. So you might have very small gradients and because everything is happening recursively, you multiply small gradients by small gradients by small gradients until gradients become so small that they vanish. And you are starting to forget the information from uh, a while back. There is a extension called LSTMs. They help somewhat, but not perfectly. And there are new innovations that might approve over transformers, very cutting edge called state, uh, state space models 
they have not become a thing scale thing yet, but they show a lot of promise. So <laughs> these things might reemerge. We'll see. Uh, there is also the issue of exploding gradients and uh, due to this recursion, they do not parallelize well. And that's was that's a massive bottleneck because we are gonna scale these things to incredible depths. And if we can't parallelize this nicely, that's not gonna be good for us because we wanna train these things fast and that's what transformer is going to enable us. Okay, so we are at, out of time. Please reminder, look at the homework soon and let's chat on Wednesday when we start the lecture about any, any questions you might have about it.